I'm really honored to be here with you today. And my topic is going to be the role of the lawyer in representing, in challenging times, a challenged industry, which is the banking industry. Now, I regard this topic as worthy of discussion because the banking industry is so crucial to the nation's overall economy. It provides the credit that fuels job growth and economic growth. It performs the invaluable service of maturity transformation. And it provides the secure payment systems and services that enable goods, services, and products to move frictionlessly. On the dark side, when the banking industry shudders, the entire economy trembles. Now, it's perhaps a bit ironic. The banking system has perhaps never been stronger in terms of capital and liquidity, but it is under severe challenge from multiple sources. Now, the first is the US economic and particularly its monetary policy. The unprecedented prolonged low interest rate environment has relentlessly squeezed net interest margins and net interest income. And that is the principal source of bank profitability. Every quarter we see higher yielding assets mature to be replaced by lower yielding assets. And more generally, a low interest rate environment produces less interest rate spread. Now, several months ago, we had the plunge in oil prices, and there was a lot of discussion in the press and elsewhere about the winners, such as automobile manufacturers, the airlines, and the consumers, and the losers, obviously, the oil companies and their vendors. In contrast, I have seen relatively little discussion about the far more significant wealth transfer resulting from prolonged low interest rates the winners here have been borrowers, everyone who borrows, large and small businesses, the consumer, and the losers have been credit providers, primarily banks. Now, let me hasten to add that I'm actually not criticizing our monetary policy. Indeed, I would applaud it as crucial to reviving our economy and reducing our still unacceptably high unemployment rate. But it undeniably represents a serious challenge for the banking industry. A second source of challenge is the difficult regulatory environment. Now, most of the headlines have been about the enormous, uh, literally exponentially greater fines that have been levied against the banking industry and now criminal pleas. But even more challenging is the permanent need to meet sharply higher regulatory expectations and requirements for compliance. I think every bank that I know has increased its compliance staff by at least threefold in the last six years, and at least several banks have increased that staff by 10 times. And the expense increase is at least equivalent in risk management and control, uh, such as for stress tests and resolution planning. Once again, this is not meant to criticize the overall regulatory approach. There were clearly inexcusable excesses and shoddy practices in the banking industry, and that contributed to the 2008 financial crisis. And to be blunt, some of the recent penalties for violations represent self-inflicted wounds. But again, we're talking about a challenge. Now, the third challenge is reputational. It is a rare day when the media or politicians are not engaging in sharp criticism of banks and bankers. There's the constant refrain of why aren't more bankers in jail? And there's a similar clamor for the largest banks to be broken up or surrender certain of their powers. It is difficult to apply metrics to the impact of this reputational challenge, but I am convinced that the the effect is substantial. Uh, you see highly qualified individuals leaving the industry or not entering the industry in the first place. And there is a mental toll on those who are in the industry. The fourth challenge is the disintermediation of the banking industry. We see wide swaths of banking services and products migrating outside the industry 
including mortgage servicing, leverage lending, and subprime lending. And there is now a direct threat to the core of banking, which is Silicon Valley's efforts to take over payments and also establish P2P consumer and small business lending. Now, what do these challenges mean for the lawyer advising the banking industry? At the outset, the goal must be to help clients understand that the regulatory climate has changed so sharply, that the approach of just several years ago in dealing with regulators does not work today, that transparency and immediacy of disclosure with regulators must be values of the highest order, that overextended regulators cannot always respond promptly to inquiries no matter how important or simple they may seem to the regulated institution, that regulators are undoubtedly conscious of the sharp and often unfounded and unfair criticism that they receive from Congress, and that in this environment, victory too often comes in the form of snatching defeat from the jaws of disaster. Now, of particular importance, clients must be encouraged to recognize that if a problem emerges and an investigation is necessary of potential misconduct, that investigation must be thorough and prompt. In our experience, the most serious penalties have often been reserved for situation not so much where the institution has flunked the underlying conduct, but where the institution has flunked the investigation. Let me now turn to one specific dilemma for lawyers in attempting to deal with this regulatory environment, and that is preservation of attorney-client and work product privilege. The Department of Justice has committed not to invade the privilege and from recent experience has abided by that commitment both directly and indirectly. But it's a different story when you turn to the bank regulators who take the position that their examination authority trumps privilege and they will demand privileged materials. So if you're a lawyer representing a client in an investigation, you've got to assume that whatever notes you take, memos you write, reports, et cetera, that you create are at the risk of being turned over to the regulators. And so you have to tell management, if you want something in writing, that is at risk of winding up in the regulators' hands. And when you conduct interviews of employees, they must be advised of this potential consequence. So every time you do one of these, a key question is, do you change your investigative approach because of this risk? Now, those will, there, it will often be said, well, why do you worry? Because there is a federal statute that provides that privileged information does not lose its privileged status because it is delivered to a bank regulator. But this still leaves the bank exposed in numerous ways. In the first place, the regulator can use the privileged information in its own enforcement action against the bank. It, this information is subject to congressional subpoena where privilege apparently does not matter. And perhaps of most concern, in many of the recent investigations where you have multiple government authorities, a common demand by each is, all right, we're not gonna ask for privileged information, but if you turn it over to anybody else, we want it as well. Now there's an answer here, at least in part, and that is a published statement by the controller of the currency, which regulates the national banks, that if they want privileged information, it can only be sought when it is clearly necessary and there is no other way to obtain the relevant information and there must be a senior committee of the controller's office that makes the determination. Uh, that needs to be a fully implemented policy which applies to all the agencies. So let me now turn to a different part of the lawyer's job and that is to deal with two prevalent but counterfactual narratives that exist with respect to the banking industry. And the lawyer, to the extent, has the opportunity, should really be trying to dispel these. Now the first relates to the advocacy for reinstatement of the Glass-Steagall Act. 
And last week, we saw the reproposal of what is called the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act by Senators Warren McCain, King, and Cantwell. Now, my point here is not to say that it is beyond debate to consider reintroduction of Glass-Steagall, but to make sure, and this is what the lawyer should be doing, make sure that this debate is conducted on the basis of actual facts rather than rhetoric. Now, the premise of the proposed legislation is that the purported repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999 was largely responsible for the financial crisis. Now, that, is just, that statement is just riddled with errors. Let's begin with the statement that the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act repealed the Glass-Steagall Act and thereby enabled banks to invest their deposits in risky securities activities. That's wrong on several counts. Only part of the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed, the part that deals with bank affiliates, not with banks itself, themselves, and the part of Glass-Steagall that deals with banks themselves and prevents them from using deposits to finance securities activities, that has remained intact. The second error is the absence of any evidence whatsoever that the partial repeal of Glass-Steagall had anything to do with the financial crisis or caused any financial institution to fail or even nearly fail. Just go down the list. Lehman, AIG, Bear Stearns, the Reserve Fund, and the GSEs would not have been subject to Glass-Steagall under any circumstances. And if you look at the problems at Wachovia, WAMU, or Citi, they had little, if anything, to do with the securities activities barred by Glass-Steagall. And third, uh, as an error, there is a similar factual problem which pervaded the original Glass-Steagall Act. Despite loudly asserted claims to the contrary by Senator Glass in 1932 and 33, subsequent scholarship has demonstrated that there were no banks of any significant size that failed because of their securities activities. Now, the second uh, of these counter-narratives, counterfactual narratives, relates to too big to fail. Now, again, a disclaimer. I, I would emphasize my view that too big to fail is bad policy that should be eradicated. Uh, my point is really that, again, the this, the actions taken with respect to what is called TBDTF should be based on actual facts, not rhetoric, and that th it should not be a function of the simplistic notion of too big. So let's look at the facts. The claim is often made that TBTF remains fully alive and that we need more radical action to ensure its demise. Now once again, let's look at the record. Secretary Liu, correctly remarked at a recent Brookings conference that TBTF has been, quote, ended as a matter of law. And again, he's correct. Dodd-Frank eliminated the moral hazard of too big to fail by requiring that in the event of a large bank's failure, shareholders are wiped out, management replaced, and creditors bear all losses. It also establishes a special resolution regime for winding down the largest financial institutions and the government's ability to use special powers to assist troubled large banks has been severely reduced. <clears throat> now, beyond that, the most important of the regulatory initiatives designed to deal with too big to fail should soon be implemented. The Federal Reserve is going to uh, uh, issue its final rules on the so-called GSIB, Globally Significantly Important Bank Surcharge, on Monday and we will be followed some months perhaps after that with a new requirement known as TLAC, Total Loss Absorption Capacity, that extends far beyond capital requirements for the largest banks. So let me lastly uh, provide a brief discussion of two other items which are related to banks and financial services because they are so much in the headlines and lawyers can help craft and advocate for solutions. The first, uh, again, this is out of the headlines, so it's the debt crises in Greece and Puerto Rico. And two observations. The first 
is that all involved should recognize the unpredictability of the situation if there is an actual and ultimate default. If there is one lesson we should have learned from the 2008 financial crisis, it is that the outcome of defaults cannot be forecast or planned for and that there is substantial risk that the anticipated outcome will be worse. Now, I seriously doubt, for example, that anyone foresaw that the bankruptcy of Lehman would doom one day later the largest money market fund, the reserve fund, and precipitate a, a, a really a total collapse of the institutional money market funds. Again, this is not to argue that the risk of default should never be run, but that the parties to the negotiations should be developing their own stress test scenarios with a healthy dollop of skepticism for unpredictability. If, for example, there were to be a default in Puerto Rico, what would be the knockout effect on the municipal bond market as a whole, uh, states whose financial uh, situation is in doubt, bond insurers, and muni bond funds? The second observation is that we all need to think creatively. These are different situations, and the old rule book on debt restructurings may well not apply when, for example, you have a country which is a part of a broader currency and economic union or there is not a truly sovereign government. And last, I want to spend a few minutes on what I think should always be top of mind today, and that is cybersecurity. I wonder how many more cyber attacks there must be or how more, more widespread the impact before we realize the need for a new coherent cybersecurity policy. The fundamental theme of such a policy would be greater cooperation and collaboration, and it, that happens in three ways, within the government itself, between the public and private sectors, and within the private sector. So let's spend a moment on each. To begin with the government itself, I would suggest strongly that we need a central office uh, dealing with cyber. And I would be so bold as to say, since this is the greatest threat, we should have a new cabinet office to create that centralization, uh, the Department of Cybersecurity. Why do I say this? At the current time, responsibility for cyber is divided between at least six federal agencies, CIA, NSA, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, Treasury, and the Air Force. And that list omits the state and local authorities and the federal agencies that are dealing just with liability issues, such as the FTC. Now, the claim will be made, we don't need centralization. We've got great coordination. Well, I would suggest that even effective coordination is far less effective than effective actual centralization. If you have lots and lots of people doing this, lots of agencies, you just have too many cooks and sous chefs, sous chefs in, the, in the kitchen, and of most importance, talent is too dispersed. What about the public and private sector? Now, efforts are being made, but there is much more that uh, could be done. We need this not to be ad hoc. We need regularized protocols for this to be effective. And we also then, finally, need uh, cooperation and collaboration among companies within various industries and even across industries. Now, there has been progress, not nearly enough. And there are real legal concerns here, which include civil liability and antitrust. So let's deal with each. With respect to civil liability, the real answer has to be legislation. And there is some pending legislation that is undeniably a step in the right direction, but the operative word remains pending. We do need this comprehensive legislation which creates immunities for companies for a wide range of actions that they might take in good faith in preparing for, preventing, and dealing with the consequences of a cyber attack. With respect to antitrust, I can understand in the current environment why people are concerned. But I would suggest that there is a way to look at this and to deal with it, which hadn't been used a lot for a number of years, but I think could be effective here, 
and that would be to go to the Department of Justice for one or more <coughs> business review letters to enable companies to collaborate in the cyberspace. And I would be, uh, I think I would expect the DOJ to be sympath sympathetic and indeed constructive in trying to get there. To conclude on this point, I do not believe I am exaggerating when I say that we are jeopardizing the future of this country unless we adopt and implement a comprehensive program to deal with cyber risk. This is the one, coming back to the banking industry, this is the one truly existential threat to that industry, but broad, more broadly to the country as a whole. And as lawyers, it is our obligation to take a leading role in attempting to reduce this threat.